there's that phrase, more money, more problems. Um, <laughs> I won't go into my rap interests and so on and hip hop, but more money, more problems. I mean, sometimes that's the case. Dr. Ben Maratapu is the co-founder and CEO of Sarah Care, a digitally enabled social care company which has raised over $400 million. He was made a member of the Order of the British Empire in 2020. We discuss how Ben has scaled Sarah, how to have good business ideas at the right time, how to be driven but not toxically so, and in the same way, how to be content but not turn complacent. We talk about whether leaders really should be vulnerable and lessons health companies can learn from ride sharing, food delivery and fintech. I hope you enjoy. So Ben, would you mind telling me a little bit about your story? Maybe you could start off with the origin story and the immigrant part of it, and then fast forward to Sierra and how you've scaled that. Absolutely. It's great to be here, Musty. So thank you for inviting me yet again. Uh, hopefully I'll provide some fresh content, something that your listeners will be keen to, to hear. In terms of my origin story, and that's flattering, by the way, because origin stories usually for people from the Avengers or whatever, of which I'm not, but it's great to call it that. Um, my parents are from Sri Lanka and they moved to the UK and London uh, during the Civil War back in the 80s. And that was a really, really tough period. Actually, their house was burned down. And so they had to come here quite suddenly. And then a few years later, I was born in North London, um, actually at Northwick Park Hospital, which is not too far from where I subsequently ended up working many years later. And sadly, when I was uh, quite young, my father passed away, actually, when I was uh, 12. That was a really difficult experience, but it it made me grow. It made me much more resilient. Uh, it made me have to step up as someone in our family to support my mother and my sister during that challenging time. And it made me focus on being a bit more serious, frankly, about work and where I was going, because even there was a relatively young age, because before that I was extremely mischievous at school. Uh, very, very kind of rebellious and yeah, I mean, people will kind of wondered if I'd end up in university in the first place or what would happen. I, my first exposure to healthcare was as a 16 year old when I did work experience in a hospital uh, in a cardiology department. And that was actually amazing. It was so eye opening because seeing patients coming in with heart attacks, receive a couple of drugs or medications, and then a few days later be up and about walking and able to go home was incredible. Uh, it was something that I didn't think was possible. And it was, it was inspiring to see the impact that a clinician and a group of people can make on patients at them, the most critical part of their lives. And that was one of the reasons I decided to get into healthcare and eventually become a doctor. So I studied medicine at university and that was both in the UK, but also in the US. When I was in the US, I focused a lot on healthcare policy um, and business as well. And that's because I was studying on the East Coast where there was a huge sense of entrepreneurship. The culture around building companies and innovation, it's, you can feel it in the air. It was completely different to my experience in the UK of studying here. And everyone had some kind of project or company that they were building. You could be a nurse, an academic researcher, a student doing it out of your dorm room. Everyone was building something entrepreneurial and innovative when I was studying on the East Coast. And then I caught the bug and I knew I wanted to build something myself. I'd love to look at how technology could be transformative. And that was in part because back then in around 2011-12 was when businesses that impact us in the real world really took off. Companies like Uber or food delivery businesses scaled. Amazon's rapid delivery service also became um, more, more present, more utilized. And it was amazing to see how technology could revolutionize these sectors, but crucially sectors that relied on lots of people. And healthcare ultimately has lots of staff, lots of people, two thirds of all healthcare costs are people costs. So seeing that made me think actually technology could revolutionize what we do in healthcare. It's going to take a bit longer given it's regulated and we deal with people's lives, but it will happen. And that was a major inflection point for me. I then came back to the UK 
I practiced as a doctor. Um, I was fortunate to actually stumble into an opportunity where I advised the CEO of the NHS on innovation technology and built a number of national programs focusing on that, which gave me a great insight into, one, what technologies can make a big difference in healthcare, because there's so many. There are over 300,000 health and wellness apps on the App Store. Only a fraction of them get adopted, and that's because only a fraction of them are solving key problems people face on the front line day to day in their patient journeys or in their journeys as healthcare professionals. And then also to see what business models succeed in healthcare. Because ultimately, if you build a health technology company, you have to have a great product, but also a great business model. And not many ventures that I see have that combination. After that, um, I became a senior advisor at Bain, um, or focusing on developing the healthcare practice in the UK and Europe. And then I decided to co-found my own company, uh, which was Sarah. And that's what I've focused on ever since. And the ambition at Sarah is to revolutionize healthcare by taking it into the home using technology. Uh, but I can tell you a bit, of, bit more about that later on. When I first met you maybe five, six years ago, and I know Sarah has been going on for a long time before that, the elderly care market didn't seem like the cool, sexy thing. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a particularly um, sought after or at least something that would come to the mind of many founders. But it seems like you were on it and you had that inflection point quite early on. Can you generally talk about how you can be someone who has good ideas at the right time, whether there's any decision-making to it, whether there's anything about the way you view the world, or is it just like a luck thing that, okay, I happen to be seeing these problems in front of me because I'm really where the rubber hits the road and that's why I spotted this problem? I think that boring industries actually make a great opportunity for building large interesting companies. And if you think about Amazon, they started with delivering books, not the most cool thing in the universe. Even their biggest um, profit maker uh, and growth driver has been Amazon Web Services, which previously wasn't seen as that cool, but now is becoming much more interesting and attractive given where cloud is going. But it's much more infrastructure technology. If you look at ordering a taxi, right? I mean, it's not a minicab company is probably not the most interesting one that you'd think about, but ride sharing, which is a technology angle on it, has been immensely impactful and has scaled across the entire world. So boring or what seem like boring sectors typically are the ones that are the most broken, actually, and in turn have the greatest opportunity for improvement, revolutionizing and using technology. I think in terms of how you pick an area you want to focus on, I always thought that you, and I still believe this, you've got to follow the data. Back when I co-founded Sarah and we launched in November 2016, telemedicine was all of the hype. There were lots of telemedicine companies. I could see why, because, you know, it's on a smartphone and you're getting access to a doctor, maybe sometimes on, on demand. But actually, when you looked under the surface, it's not solving a massive problem. In healthcare, you still have the same amount of contact time between a patient and a doctor. So the, the scalability is pretty similar. And also, frankly, a lot of GP practices in the UK and elsewhere were already using Skype to have video calls with patients or even, and doctors for many, many years have been doing phone calls to patients as well. So it wasn't, when you look under the service, that big a breakthrough and that disruptive, even though there was a lot of hype around it. Also in telemedicine, what I found was back in 2016, most of the people using it tend to be younger, healthier, sometimes millennials, people who want to attract their health conditions, which is fine. But these are not the people who use healthcare the most. The people who use healthcare the most are actually ones with multiple health conditions, multiple vulnerabilities, tend to be older people as well, who are less likely actually to use a smartphone and engage with telemedicine. And what that meant was, Again, if you go one level deeper to the data, a number of the patients using telemedicine companies wouldn't go back and use them day in, day out. They'd use them here and there. And ultimately that meant the underlying financials of telemedicine were harder to make work because you've got to spend a lot of money to market and attract customers who want to use telemedicine. And if you're not getting multiple engagements from them afterwards, the amount of money and profit you can make from the from those consultations is limited. And actually, in some instances, you're spending more to get the customer than the amount you're getting from them. 
which ultimately is unprofitable. So I was looking at telemedicine and thinking the fundamentals of this aren't aligned with what I would be looking for. I knew healthcare would go from hospital to home. That was a strong theme that I was seeing in other countries. It made a lot of sense. It was happening in other sectors as well. And I knew that actually the people who use healthcare the most are the ones who are older with multiple health conditions. And I thought what type of business could actually focus on those areas to be much more sustainable, make a big impact, use technology and have a great business at the same time. And looking at the data, even more so, it was social care and care in the home that I found to be, while a bit boring, some may say, the greatest scope for impact because it was even more analog than other parts of healthcare. People were using pen and paper. Some instances they were storing paper records in bin bags because they didn't even have filing cabinets. It's so old school um, compared to, okay, some GP practices are using Skype to have teleconsultations. Seems quite forward thinking. They are tracking notes online. Seems forward thinking. So social care was so backwards from a technology point of view very fragmented, full of thousands and thousands of small businesses. Clearly, it's going to grow because people need more and more care. And it gives a good inroad for providing other services. So if you can attract these people who need care in the home, win them over as customers, you can then start looking after them in other ways. You can provide telemedicine appointments. You can provide nurses or medications to be delivered to their doors. And so looking at the fundamentals and following the data are what ultimately led me to looking at Sarah. There is some luck involved though, as you touched on, because timing is also important. You may see the fundamentals of a business and say, this is really going to work. But the question is, when is it going to work? When is the technology going to be adopted? When is this business really going to take off? And sometimes in healthcare, I feel people have been a bit early. They've gotten the model right. It's just been too early for customers or too early for the NHS or insurance companies. And as a result, they haven't seen the scale that they wanted. So you've got to follow the data, but timing is also important too. Before we started recording, you didn't use these words, but you were basically saying, look, man, it's it's lonely at the top. But the point being that there's not been many UK health tech companies that have reached tremendous scale. And I wanted to ask you if you could fill in the story of Sarah and how you've grown it since, since its inception. And maybe you could zero in on some of the good decisions you made along the way or what you think has led to you being able to scale along that way. So the origin story on Sarah as well. Okay, got it. <laughs> what I'd say is, um, so we knew we wanted to focus on care in the home and use technology to make it better, get the right care in the right place, um, give carers an app so they have all the information at in their fingertips. And we launched in November of 2016, initially by just recruiting some carers, sending them to people's homes and having our basic app, which outlined and provided some of the tools I mentioned. Then the, actually the biggest challenge wasn't where technology could be used. I thought that was pretty clear given how backwards the industry was, given where technology was being used in other sectors, it was pretty clear what could be done. It was the scaling journey that was harder to crack. And this is a common in all healthcare, almost all healthcare businesses, I would say, because healthcare is not a product where you see an ad on the tube and you say, yeah, I'm going to try that this weekend. Or you kind of see a YouTube ad and click on it like, yeah, okay, why not? I'll just order that to come to my home. It doesn't work like that. People make careful decisions over a period of time. Uh, these are life-changing decisions. Sometimes they're very expensive decisions. All of that means the sales cycle is much slower and you've got to crack the growth in a different way. So initially we did focus on a lot of direct consumer marketing. We did marketing on the tube. We did all the things that I just mentioned that probably don't work. And we found out the hard way that that was very challenging. It was really expensive to get customers and people to use the product and in turn uh, generate enough revenue and income from the people who are receiving our services to, so that the whole thing overworked as a business model. So we then pivoted, and this was a, a key decision, to partnering with hospitals, the NHS and local authorities to solve problems they had when it came to care in the home so that Sarah could be scaled. And that was partly because looking at the data again, it was clear that there are around four and a half thousand people every day waiting in hospitals to be discharged into their home. And I thought, actually, well, we look after people in their home with carers and using our technology, we can probably get them out of hospital really fast because we can get the right carer to that person's door to receive them. 
so this is potentially something we can do something about. And we started knocking on doors to different NHS hospitals, commissioners, uh, other contacts that we may have been able to find and so on. And eventually got our first partnership where we would be we would receive referrals from an NHS trust to then support patients being discharged from hospital to home and look after them in their home for the period thereafter. It could be because they've just had a hip replacement, they need to go home. It could be that they had a stroke, something much more significant, need to go home and receive services and support at the home. And that actually was a much more powerful business model for us because the referrals... Um, we would get lots of them as the demand for getting people out of hospital and into the home is really high. Um, and hospitals need to do this so that they can create capacity, they can create flow, they can have the space to get more patients in from A&E and treat them. Uh, and if you walk on many hospital wards in the UK, unfortunately, you will see a number of older people who are on wards who don't need to be there. They're waiting for the care to start in the community, but hasn't started quickly enough. And so we got a lot of referrals. And we started looking after people. And this actually was a much more sustainable growth engine for Sarah because, of course, the partnerships that we are forging, we're not paying by customer. We're not having investing a lot in marketing. And the partnerships tend to last several years. So we get referrals for several years. We build a relationship. We build a track record. And that's actually quite a scalable business. It also means that rather than having to focus on demand and customer acquisition, which is the challenge in most businesses as they grow, we just focused on supply and the product. So ensuring we have the right number of carers and the right staff, and also our technology is working really well. That was a major decision that allowed us to scale much more effectively than we had been. Another decision, I think, along the journey was to go from a pure technology company, which is what we originally thought about. Maybe we should just be an online marketplace who connects healthcare staff, like carers and nurses who need to visit people in the home, to patients and their families. We just connect, we don't manage the service. But instead we realized we needed to go from a pure technology company to a technology enabled service where we are recruiting the carers and the nurses. We're managing themselves, we're regulated by the CQC, the healthcare regulator, we're accountable for those services. And the reason we made that pivot and that decision was because being a pure play uh, technology marketplace didn't allow us to actually control the customer experience and the quality of the service people were receiving in the home. It didn't allow us also to partner with the NHS and with local government for those to receive the referrals I talked about, because to do that, you have to be regulated. They'll only deal with a regulated player. And the other element, which subsequently became really important for Sarah, if you're a technology-enabled service and you're regulated, you need to collect data on how your patients are doing. You need to track how they're doing and how their symptoms and health will change over time. And that would, we would find, be very important for a later part of our journey of how we use data to predict if people are going to become unwell, to intervene earlier on, to keep them at home rather than them having to go to a hospital avoidably. And that decision to go from online marketplace to a regulated technology-enabled service was a major decision for the company, but ultimately, I think, the right one. The other decisions that I'd say that I've had to learn a lot about um, have been how do you set up good processes? How do you scale a business? How do you focus a product team? How do you make sure that you're not going too broadly and exploring lots of different opportunities in parallel, opportunities of which partnerships to pursue, which parts of the country to grow in, uh, which ways to grow our product offering, going from being too broad to actually being much more focused. That's been a real learning for me. And then also people-related decisions, um, which I know you want to go, go into and talk about, and we can cover that soon. But in essence, as a doctor, you don't ever get taught how to manage and build a team. You don't get taught how to recruit and hire really well um, and to in, it, empower the staff around you to go further, to become stronger leaders, to drive cultural improvement. It's just not what we're taught in medical school. Or even when we work, when we are working on hospital wards or in GP practices or elsewhere, it's just not something we learn actively. But that's so important when you're building a company, because ultimately the company is about the people. Even if it's pure play technology, it's about the engineers and the product managers and the user experience and how everyone comes together to build a brilliant technology-based product. It's about the people. 
And those were skills that I had to develop on the fly as Sarah grew. And I had to scale with the company, which given we expanded very quickly, particularly over the past few years, has been challenging. Um, but that's where I feel that I've had to develop the most. And also in terms of our origin story, where I've learned and made mistakes and in turn, hopefully improve my decision-making as well. To just tell you where we are now as Sarah, we deliver healthcare in people's homes um, across the UK and across Germany. We deliver 50,000 patient appointments a day. So we are the largest digital first home healthcare company in Europe. And we've grown very fast. So we've grown around a hundred fold in the past three years. And we have over a thousand employees full-time who are not frontline, but focusing on technology operations, brand, finance, and elsewhere. And we're continuing to scale across the UK and internationally. And we've gone from just delivering care in the home with carers to now other services as well. Nurses, doctors, medication delivery. So we really are a holistic home healthcare partner and provider um, nationwide. Every health founder I speak to in the UK, the first thing on their mind is expansion into the US or even just launching initially in the US. And you're in England and Germany at the moment. Is there a reason why you haven't made a US play yet? Is it harder than it looks? Like what's, what's the reasoning there? Great question, Musty. I think firstly, the UK market for what we do is very large. It's in the tens of billions of pounds. And to put that into perspective, if you take another sector, let's say the food delivery market, the food delivery market for all of Europe is 30 billion pounds in size for all of Europe. And that's for companies such as Deliveroo, Uber Eats, Just Eat, Delivery Hero, and so on. We have a larger market than that just in the UK. And that's why we want to focus on really doing a great job of the UK and scaling Sarah. Even now, we only have a few percent market share of the home care and home health care market, despite being pretty large. And that high ceiling for growth means that there's just so much more to do. And the more we focus on the UK, the better we actually become, the higher the quality of the service, the more data we have to try better data algorithms, the more partnerships we have with parts of the NHS, local authorities and other players as well. There's a virtuous circle that reinforces the strength of the Sarah model. And that's why we keep focusing more and more on the UK. We expanded to Germany because we wanted to internationalize to prove we could do it. Um, the German market is actually larger than the UK. And because the German population is a bit older than the UK, the need for elderly care and home health care is greater. And that business has scaled very fast. It's already profitable. We launched there about a year and a half and it's continuing to grow and expand, which is, which is excellent. But between the UK and Germany, we already have a massive market for us to be focusing on. The US is of interest to us, definitely, but it's a longer term ambition. The other point I'd make is saying the, that there is a US health system is a bit like saying there is a Western European health system because each of the states operates in a slightly different way in terms of how they reimburse healthcare, what their priorities are, the models they use. And so when you look at the US, you've got to be willing to embrace either a state by state model, or if one wants to tackle the whole country, there needs to be a significant amount of capital and risk appetite to make that happen. Because we've got a lot more room to grow in the UK and Germany, we just think that, yes, the UK is a massive opportunity, but it's going to be there later on as well. And it's definitely too large for just one player to take. So even if there were competition, we'd be fine with that. Plus, we'd need to make a very, very significant investment and potentially take a risk because we haven't proven that, our model there. Well, we've proven our model in the UK and Germany. So it's much more just replicating what we know works. Got you. In terms of businesses, there's clean businesses on one side, which I would regard as things like selling a book online or maybe making like a Photoshop clone, which basically you kind of sell the product or you do the service and that's sort of it. There's no more headache. And then on the other side, there's a messy businesses, which is probably where care fits in, where it's a lot more difficult and you can't, can't just sell the thing and then wash your hands of it. And I just wanted to get your take on that comment. Has has working in the elderly care market, has it been that massive headache, which I imagine it would be? I mean, you've got all the regulatory problems. You've got this thing where it's an actual like emotional issue for families and the people receiving the care as well. And 
D- does it end up being kind of a huge headache for you or does it end up being a huge defensible moat that makes your business really hard to compete with? What's the what's your take? Initially, it is definitely a challenge and a moat to overcome. It's much more complex than uh, if we built a dating app or something um, because we've got regulatory compliance, as you said, we've got recruiting, vetting, training, and looking after staff. We've got branding, marketing, winning partnerships, servicing them. And then of course, there's all of the technology, product data, engineering. There's so many facets to the business. I think for the toughest sectors to crack, which in turn are sometimes the largest market opportunities, they are more complex like this. An example would be if you, if you look at what Tesla have done with uh, building first electric vehicles and then also trying to build autonomous vehicles, that's really tough. It's regulated. You've got people uh, of all sorts of ages and backgrounds being able to drive your vehicles. Uh, You've got infrastructure and government challenges in terms of whether they even have an interest in electric vehicles. I mean, this is rewinding five, 10 years ago when they're in an early stage of their journey. But the pie is massive and it's, it is more complex, but as a result, it's been left alone and hasn't been innovated properly. And that creates a massive opportunity to build something truly impactful and transformational. Even then, what I'd say is you mentioned books. With Amazon, as an example, with their delivery service and their prime service, that still involves a lot of people. Amazon is a massive employer. The people working in their warehouse, the people who handle the logistics to ensure that a product is um, allocated and in turn uh, deployed to the right place very, very quickly. That involves a lot of people operating in concert. And so that business requires excellent operations, processes, people management, combined with brilliant technology. I would also say that over the past 10 years, there's been a greater movement towards looking at regulated sectors and sectors that involve large numbers of staff and people. Ride sharing and food delivery businesses are examples of those, which you'd say are potentially less clean. But these are areas that are massive, that are outdated, that need change and that present tremendous business opportunities. Lastly, I'd say that healthcare, two thirds of all healthcare spend is on people. And if you want to stay away from people or you don't want to be regulated, which means you can't even provide a proper service, then there isn't that large a pie to be going after. And I'd query whether you're making a truly impactful difference to the healthcare model. You've got to transform both the people side of healthcare and the platform or technology side to have a truly differentiated model that a health system or an insurance company or a government can lean on and rely on. They can't just rely on technology. They, whereas if you provide both the technology and the people, they can rely on you to deliver the service, take care of it, give them peace of mind and make a big impact. I want to pick your brain on cross-pollination from other industries into healthcare. I always feel like healthcare is five or 10 years behind every other industry in a lot of things. And I just wanted to ask, have you picked up things from other sectors that you've brought and applied to healthcare? Are there, whether it's kind of frameworks, whether it's particular tactics or strategies they use, uh, just anything really, are you picking things up from other other sectors? Yeah, a ton. I mean, I've, I have, I've found that a lot of the inspiration for what we do next at Serra has come from other sectors, technologies that they're trialing, ways in which they've improved the product and user experience. I mean, I've made a lot of references to food delivery and ride sharing businesses, but that's because they have large numbers of staff and they have to coordinate them through an app and they have to provide a great experience. And there's a lot of logistics underpinning it as well to get the right person or product in the right place at the right time. Some of that has homologies with Sarah and what we do to get the right healthcare professional in the right place at the right time. And so learning from them means that we can accelerate our journey. We can accelerate the impact. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Of course, we're dealing with people's lives. We're dealing in a regulated sector. So we can't just lift and shift the technology. We have to adapt. We have to learn. And it is more complex. But there's so many sources of inspiration. Um, I'll look at what's happening with fintech quite frequently because that's a regulated complex industry. That's an industry where you've got large legacy players, some of whom are pretty backwards in how they operate. And there are lots of stakeholders. There's a lot of governance um, to, to work through. But there's so much to learn to see how fintech companies have progressed, how the 
the different companies in the UK, even with Starling, Monzo, Revolut, the different journeys they've taken to grow and scale, to win more customers, to build a product that people love. Uh, there's so much you can learn from it. And yes, healthcare may be behind the times, but the advantage of that is we get to see all the mistakes that everyone else has made to try and avoid ourselves falling into those pitfalls. Are there any anti-lessons you've taken from the ride sharing and the, the food services? Because uh, from what I can tell, they don't look like they're turning a profit or they're not really making sense from that point of things. And you've got a similar issue where you've got a lot of, say, staff costs and people costs. Um, is there anything you've taken from them? Definitely. I'll give you a few examples. So I think ride sharing and food delivery companies don't always prioritize how they're looking after staff. And um, that's, and also they sometimes run into regulatory challenges. And that was very clear. And it's been covered heavily by the press. If you see what Uber's journey has been like, what Deliveroo's journey is very visible. So we were almost excessively proactive in ensuring we had a great relationship with our regulator. We dotted the I's across the T's. We were very proficient on regulatory compliance. We had an almost excessive approach of how we look after our staff, how we train them, how we make them feel rewarded. We looked at the challenges they went through, or the anti-lessons as you put it, and in and ensure that we almost over-prioritize those areas to get it right. And that's why when carers start using our app, ENPS improves 95 points because we have intentionally built the app so that they love using it. It's intuitive, it's easy, it addresses their day-to-day -day issues. They prefer that model. We've made sure that our technology means that they spend more time caring and less time traveling so their job gets better, they enjoy it more, so that they can get access to online training so they feel they're being invested in rather than just being people who go from A to B. These are all things that we've intentionally focused on having learned from other sectors so that we can have a much stronger and effective model. Um, and then when you talk about profitability, all of our operations are profitable. Um, and we've been very keen uh, and very astute about ensuring that happens. Even last year, the profitability of our, oh, our operations almost quadrupled, right? So it grew a lot. And that was a particular focus for us because of the learnings of not just companies in other sectors, as you mentioned, food delivery, ride sharing elsewhere, but even companies in healthcare and health tech who've who burn a lot of money, don't always have a clear part to profitability. And that creates risk for the business, creates risk for the patients and for the staff. We don't want to be in that position. And so from the very early journeys of Sarah, when it, which comes back to my point around looking at the data and the fundamentals, I wanted to go after a model that had, yes, really impactful disruptive technology, but a business model to match. And so focusing on care in the home worked for us because our carers typically visit a person three times a day, every day, for years, for years, right? Imagine if you had three Ubers a day, every day for years. I mean, the economics would look very different, right? So I intentionally focused on a part of healthcare, which is very sticky, very recurring, where you build a strong relationship with the patient or the customer and provide a great experience to them. But it also means that the financials work out way better. And that meant very early on, our operations became profitable at Sarah. Uh, I mean, it's been the case for a few years now. So that was an intentional strategy, having seen some of the difficult experiences that other businesses have gone through. And given the stock markets over the past year, of course, that's been compounded. Uh, companies that are unprofitable or burning a lot of money that are focused on technology have seen a dramatic negative impact on their valuation and share price. I noted this question down a few months ago, and it's around how do you stop drive from becoming toxic how do you avoid fulfillment turning into complacency so it's like those two ends of the stick and there's this quote that goes from mark twain to cornelius vanderbilt who was the railroad tycoon and he basically says how i pity you and this is honest you're an old man and ought to have some rest and yet you have to struggle and deny yourself and rob yourself of restful sleep and peace of mind because you need money so badly i always feel for a man who is so poverty ridden as you. <laughs> so from from me to you, um, are you poverty ridden? And uh, also, how, how do you balance that drive and complacency element? Okay, so I think that, um, I mean, I love making an impact. And throughout my career, whether it's practicing as a doctor or working in policy or working in consulting or being an academic, I've always focused on using healthcare to make a difference 
And that's been a big driver. It's again, it's like a virtuous cycle for me. The bigger the impact I make, the more I want to do it. And it, and that has kept me motivated and driven. The impact at the same time keeps me sober. I'm not doing what I do just to try and earn more or to personally gain a significant amount. I think that ultimately isn't particularly fulfilling and you'll run out dry quite quickly. But because I really want to revolutionize healthcare, I want to make a massive difference, whether it's my role at Sarah or in the other ways I'm trying to contribute to healthcare, that keeps my drive more sustainable. I think that complacency isn't something I've... There's always different stresses and issues and challenges that one has to go through. And as the company grows really fast, I'm always being stretched in different ways. That means there's not a huge amount of room to even be complacent because I'm always pushed outside of my comfort zone. I guess it's more about moderating that to ensure that I'm not overstretched is what I'd say and that I am having, let's say, a good work-life balance um, and making time for my family and my wife and so on and such that my drive in the company isn't at the detriment to those parts of my life. That's continuous work in progress there. And go on. No, I was just going to say on the work-life balance point as well, there's the um, Twitter debate that comes up quite a lot. And I think it's Keith Braboy, uh, the famous American investor and Naval Ravikant. And one of their points is that if you're an entrepreneur who's looking to build something amazing and change healthcare, you are basically an Olympic athlete in your own right of, of entrepreneurship. And therefore you need the same kind of drive, the same drive that you see in the Michael Jordan documentary. And you, you can't have a work-life balance. Um, what's your take on that? Because uh, it, it, it like, it's, it's a tempting, I don't know, it's an attractive proposition that if you're looking to have such a big scale, maybe you shouldn't have a work-life balance. I think that if you want to have a multi-year journey um, of building a business over years and decades or really revolutionizing a sector, which pretty much every sector is tough to change. It takes a lot of persistence, a lot of resilience, going against the grain, being a pioneer, looking for what's new. And um, that is a, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And so to your point of being an Olympic athlete, you've got to pace yourself properly. If you push a bit, if you push too hard, the risk of burnout, the risk of a lack of motivation, it w can really backfire. And so ensuring you've got the right processes and mechanisms such that you can be more balanced, you can be more sustainable, and you can run the whole marathon is important. There are certain parts where you may have to run a bit faster, definitely, because there's a really important opportunity you're pursuing, or there's a push to grow even further that you want to, or a target you're trying to aspire for. Or let's say there's a funding round that needs to be closed, it just requires you to push a bit harder as a leader of business. But overall, you need to be sustainable, I would definitely say, because it's a marathon, not a sprint. And in sectors such as healthcare, it takes time. Healthcare businesses, if you compare their time to scale versus other sectors, it is significantly longer. And that means you have to adapt your journey individually as a leader and for, what you, for the pace you set for your team so that you avoid burning out or you avoid burning your team out and in turn having an unsustainable sprint that ultimately leads you to go backwards. There's this line of thinking that I see in a lot of online literature and podcasts and such, which basically it's a mishmash of like bro science and evolutionary psychology. And I think Will Storr wrote a really good book on it called The Status Trap or The Status Game, something like that. But it basically, when people like yourself say that what really drives me is my mission and to change healthcare, it basically uh, calls BS on that and says that our real motivations are always around either kind of money or status or something more, I'd say, primal rather than the things that we tell other people. Do you think that's a fair comment to make about people like yourselves who are like doing incredibly well and then they go out and tell people that they have this like big grand ambition but really deep down it's these underlying mot motivations that's a great question and what i would say to that is people are different i mean if you look at people who work in a charity i don't think they're in that to make a ton of money they probably would have chosen a different profession i don't think that they're necessarily in that for fame in the same way people who want to be carers, nurses, doctors, if we talk about healthcare, becoming a doctor is not the same, it doesn't have the same prestige or compensation that it used to 10, 20 years ago. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is there are clearly people going into lines of work and they're not choosing it for necessarily the money 
or for the fame, as you put it, but they're doing it because they want to make a big difference. And I originally came into healthcare to be a doctor, to look after patients, to work in the NHS. My, my route has been a bit different or serendipitous to land me in, in working for Sarah. But I would say that, yeah, I want to make uh, an impact. And that is my main driver. It's less about some of the other things we've talked about. What I would say, though, is I'm very driven about the scale of that impact. And I'm, uh, I wouldn't, I'm not shy about saying that I wouldn't, I want to have, and I want Sarah to have a tremendous impact on the way healthcare is delivered. And such that when one looks back at what healthcare in the home and healthcare at large looked like before Sarah was here and after, I want there to be a permanent, significant, visible difference. Because I believe that's necessary, but that's also what I want to do. It's kind of part of my career aspiration. It's part of what motivates me. And it's that impact at scale. So that's probably why I'd say I'm driven towards, um, if you had to call BS, I guess. Um, but I would push back on uh, um, that quote uh, or the, the comment you mentioned from the person you were listening to and say that some people are different. And you can see that based on the jobs they end up doing. When you look at your founder buddies who've reached a similar scale to you, do you generally notice that they're happier uh, about the same, like say compared to the general population? Because you'd expect to, uh, to see that they'd be much happier, much more fulfilled, right? Much more content. I mean, what's your experience been of that? I think they'd be happier, much more fulfilled after they've maybe, you know, the company has had an exit or something like that. <laughs> and the people that I know who are running... Uh, Businesses that are scaling fast, like at Revolut as an example, or uh, in terms of fintech or large e-commerce companies that have grown massively over the, over recent years, growth is is challenging. Growth is stressful. Growth has growing pains, and all of them are thinking about okay, wow. So the business is a multiple bigger than it was a year or two ago. This is a new set of challenges. It's a new phase for me as a leader. I have to adapt. And that adaptation, that being outside of your comfort zone, it's stretching, right? It's not easy. It's hard. I think being a founder is one of the hardest things you can do. If I compare it to any of the roles I've had in the past, frontline clinical practice, working policy, being an academic, even working in more of a consulting firm or corporates, this is by far harder than all of those put together, right? Building a company to go against the grain from scratch and growing quickly in a regulated market that's tough. So they, when I see them, it's more sharing war stories and battle scars than it is about, oh yeah, I'm so fulfilled and I'm, ha I'm so happy. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah, you can be happy about the results and the impact, but make no mistake, um, being a founder and building a company that scales fast is challenging and it continuously pushes you. But ultimately, yeah, you grow as a person in a way that you never would have been able to before. You make a difference that is hard to to have in almost any other guise or, or role. And um, it is fulfilling. Um, it's just the challenges alongside it sometimes distract you from that fulfillment. Ben, could you describe to me in, in a personal sense what or how your life materially changes once you raise so much money or you scale your company so, so much? Um, like once you get that big fat, check into your uh, company's banking account is is the is the like the yacht on order have you completely changed you've joined the billionaire boys club and <laughs> and life changes like how does it actually how does it actually materially impact your life so you're talking about when we received significant investment into the company right and close around or are you talking about i would say more the general scale the, more than the money i would say it's just the scale and the kind of perceived success and that kind of thing how does that change your life there's a lot more responsibility is what i'd firstly say and um, i'm because i'm looking after uh, through sarah many people many employees well-being and many many patients every single day in this country and others that's a that's a significant responsibility before sarah i don't think i'd ever lost a night of sleep i don't think i'd ever had a I, I, I slept so well. I slept like a lock. It was great. Um, even as a junior doctor, I, it was that it was never an issue. I started wondering, you know, how, why do people sometimes complain about sleep? Set up a company. That changed. 
<laughs> and so building something that scales and becomes larger and larger yes um it is uh it's you're making an impact um there's a bit of prestige to it but there's a lot more responsibility a lot more weight a lot more challenge and actually the bigger the company becomes and the stronger one's leadership team that means that the problems that ultimately land on your desk are even more difficult because if you've got a brilliant cfo or chief technology officer or person running operations they can handle most of the issues so the items that they can't are really really tough or tricky and ultimately as a ceo or as a leader of a large organization that's the stuff that lands on your desk that you've got to navigate and if it's something new then you have to learn you've got to learn fast you've got to deal with it and the repercussions of not making the right decision are far more severe so judgment and developing judgment and make sure you've got the right data and tools to make the right decisions becomes paramount. But that's, that's actually a, it's a larger weight to carry. I think for me, um, I enjoy leadership. I enjoy being able to empower and see other people succeed and support them in doing that. So there's a lot of enjoyment I get from that. Um, but there's the responsibility and challenge, I think, scales with the company and scales with the influence you can have um, with the funds that you've been able to raise with the business, with the staff that you have and the resources. So that's probably how I'd say, it. I don't think it's just all plain sailing. Definitely not. And there's, what is it? There's that phrase, more money, more problems. Um, <laughs> I won't go into my rap interests and so on and hip hop, but uh, more money, more problems. I mean, sometimes that's the case. Got you. <laughs> I want to ask you a little bit about vulnerability as a leader. And just to put forward that I think there was a really viral TED talk that went out called The Power of Vulnerability. And I don't like when I feel like things are popular or there's it's kind of the in thing and I don't necessarily agree with it. And that's how I felt about that talk. So essentially, it's, it, it's kind of putting forward that as a leader, it's like a good thing to be vulnerable. And yeah, that's all great. And then on the other side of that, there's the populist strongman type leaders that have come forward where they have no vulnerability <laughs> and i would like position those two statements as like on one side you've got the power of vulnerability as a leader and then on the other side you've got this magnetism of certainty where you as a leader are expected to you know know your shit people are attracted to that when you know where you're going and maybe that's your job as a leader maybe you, even if you do have some doubts you shouldn't be projecting them out and that's the side I would say it seems more sensible to me, at least if I was in an organization. What's your take on what I've just said? Firstly, I tend to be less bothered about the hot trends that people are discussing. In the same way that I mentioned that when we co-founded Sarah, telemedicine was the hot trend. But actually, I'm much more interested in the fundamentals, what the data and the facts suggest. I think um, when it comes to leadership, and there is a balance between vulnerable and presenting kind of a strong front and face. And it depends. You've got to, you need to develop a toolkit of different styles as a leader and apply the relevant one depending on the situation. It's not one size fits all. And so there are instances where, yeah, actually being vulnerable is important. If you're trying to build trust with a colleague or they're going through a tough time and actually it helps them to know that you're feeling that too that's helpful and people want to see that authenticity they want to see the genuine you but at the same time if there is a short-term crisis and that requires people to be mobilized and to be uh, deployed in a specific way or we've got to come up with a new plan action that plan and get it done to get to a better position um, that requires strength and it requires clarity and it may not be necessarily the right time to be vulnerable. Uh, an example I'd give is back in 2020 when the pandemic started. At Sarah, we didn't even know if our carers were going to be classed as essential workers. So we didn't know if the, when the country went into lockdown, whether we would even continue delivering a service. And so at that point, I had to think about what are the alternative models for the business if we can't keep delivering care because that's how we make money. What are some of the, what's the plan B, plan C? That requires strength, conviction, clarity to you and to your core team and I, I wouldn't say necessarily that's the right time to be 
going down the deep vulnerability route, right? And so actually what happened was we realized that as carers were essential workers, but also that because a number of people had lost their jobs, there was the chance for us to provide them with jobs in care by retraining them using technology. And so we launched this massive jobs program a few days later where we would recruit and train 10,000 people from other sectors who lost jobs to work in care, to make an impact and to help alleviate the pressures in the pandemic. And we delivered that, right? We launched literally days after the country went into lockdown and we aim, we wanted to get that done in, I think, a year and a half. And we did it in less than that. And we made a massive difference to people who needed jobs and to people who needed care to take pressures off the NHS during that critical time. But that requires strength and conviction. So there are different tools in the toolkit and um, there are different styles that a person or a leader needs to adopt depending on the situation. And in a startup where the business is changing quarter on quarter and always looks in a different, uh, in a different way and is a different size and scale uh, quarter on quarter, especially in the early days, that adaptability, that nature of being dynamic is crucial. I think also when it comes to what people out there are thinking and about leadership and authenticity and vulnerability, I mean, I recently saw a film called Air um, in the cinema, which is about how Nike it's called Michael Jordan to uh, get the Air Jordan brand up and running. And I started looking up Michael Jordan in a bit more detail. And there was this, he, he received this Lifetime and Hall of Fame award uh, from the NBA uh, over 10 years ago. But he cried when he received it and he was giving this really authentic speech about how his mother supported him, how all these people supported him through his life. And then people made fun of it, right? Because they saw this person who's seen as an icon, who's seen as this really alpha personality who always wants to win, who's super competitive, now be really emotional and vulnerable. And actually our society made fun of it, which runs in contrast to what you were just talking about. And that's why... I don't tend to go with kind of what the hot topic is, but instead I look, try and look a bit more about the fundamentals and why being that way is helpful for me and for the organization and building trust with the people I work with. So Ben, a few years ago, you gave me some networking advice, which was basically that every year, I think on New Year's Day, you send out <laughs> an email or a communication to your mentors or people have helped you and just give them a little update and say thank you and like like a just catching up type email and I started doing it and to be honest it, it, it I think it worked quite well it took a lot of time but then every other person I've spoken to about this tip like this hot tip I've gotten from you has said that's a terrible idea don't do that that's a really annoying email to receive uh, and don't recommend it so Firstly, I just wanted to ask you about whether you still stand behind that tip. And then secondly, I'd love to hear any more of your thoughts on networking, relationship building, maintaining relationships, etc. I think the lesson here is that I've got to be really careful about the advice I give you because you can <laughs> go around asking other people if it's any good or not. I think, um, so let's just clear a few things up. Um, I am, um, yes, fine. I wish people a happy new year. I wouldn't do much more than that in terms of giving them a life update about my personal trials and tribulations and what's been going on. But I think I think it's nice to build relationships and to have different checkpoints for doing that over time. Uh, I would still say that. Do I still wish people a happy new year? I mean, yeah, people close to me like friends and family and some work colleagues. It's much more about depth than breadth. Uh, in building Sarah and trying to become a leader and manage large numbers of teams and staff, and look after them as well. And um, deep relationships and connections and bonds, people who you can trust, people you can go through, go to during times of challenge, who you can get advice and mentorship from, and who you can speak very plainly with in a safe, comfortable way. That's super important. And that takes time. It takes investment. You give or you get as much as you give. Uh, and that's what I would I'd advocate for. I'm much more a fan of having deep collaborations and uh, connections and relationships rather than necessarily knowing thousands and thousands of people who I interact with once in a blue moon. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll get rid of my 200 strong New Year's email list. Oh, then. Okay, so I think <laughs> I need to be a bit more specific about the advice that I'm giving as well. That's not what I necessarily advocated, but yeah, thanks, Marty. <laughs> okay.
I hope you enjoyed that episode. You can find all my links by going to bigpicturemedicine.co.uk. And if you've been enjoying the podcast, please consider leaving a review. And by the way, all of these episodes are available in video format on YouTube and on Spotify. And if you enjoyed this interview, you might enjoy episode 29 of this podcast, which was my first ever interview with Ben. Cover a bit more about his story and some of the moves he made early on. Thanks for listening.